We are really pleased to have with us Benjamin Bischoff today. He's coming to us from Germany. Benjamin is a test automation engineer with Trivago, but he's also a magician in his spare time. Yeah, that's true. I've been doing magic uh, since I was a kid. Started at eight, uh, with eight years, roughly. Well, we're looking forward to some test automation magic today. His session today is old tools and new tricks. So we're looking forward to uh, to learning about those. Benjamin, over to you. Thanks a lot for having me. Uh, good morning, good night, good day, wherever you might be. Uh, this is actually the earliest conference talk I ever had to do. So this is old tools, new tricks. A little bit about me. As, as was said, I'm a test automation engineer at Trivago in Düsseldorf, Germany, where our headquarters is as well. Um, I've been in IT for around 24 years. I started the first 15 as a 100% developer. Um, basically, you could have said full stack developer. And then um, I grad gradually went into the QA direction and I'm now a software development engineer in test or test automation engineer. And what's also important uh, in the context of this whole talk is that I'm a clean code enthusiast and a code craftsmanship en enthusiast. And this is part of my, let's say, mission to get this back into test code. A little disclaimer here, because what I say in this presentation can be controversial. These are my views. And of course, feel free to disagree. In fact, I encourage you to disagree with me. Um, and this is also less about how, but it's more about the why. So don't expect me to show you a lot of practical new tricks with old tools, but it's more about why you should consider choosing older tools. And also important, I'm not against AI and AI solutions. I use those a lot. I'm uh, one of the healthy skeptics, you could say. So whatever I say in the context of this talk, don't think that I'm bashing AI. So let's start with the purpose and the preface of why I actually wanted to do this presentation. Because in this space as developers and test automation engineers and QA engineers, we are just hit with a lot of different technologies all the time and more and more are, are added every day. Uh, by the way, this list is uh, generated by ChatGPT, so I'm not sure if all those technologies actually exist, I didn't check. So if you see some technology that you think, uh, I have no idea what this is, maybe it doesn't exist. So when you have this whole list of technologies and approaches and tools and methodologies, you always have to ask yourself, what is worth dealing with? What brings value? But more importantly, what is not worth dealing with? What can I just ignore and forget about? This is the even tougher decision. So I wanted to start to check the inside of the developer's brain. Um, like I said, I have been and still am a developer by heart. So um, I think I'm kind of qualified to do that, at least with my brain. Um, and I want to start with the new is always better dilemma. You will see that in this talk, there are a lot of dilemmas that I talk about, and this is the first one. So the question is, is new always better? I know that developers generally love new things and uh, learning new things is absolutely crucial. It's a must to stay on top of the game and expand your arsenal of tools that you have on your belt for later and just generally spark new ideas. If you use new software with new approaches, it might give you ideas for other uh, 
solutions of problems that you're dealing with in the future. And I found this uh, dad joke because I'm a big fan of dad jokes. What do you do with 100 peaches? You eat what you can and you can what you can't. It uh, takes a while <laughs> to get that. Hopefully a lot of you do. Um, but this fits quite well here because if you consider those technologies and tools as peaches, you use a few of those and you store all the rest of them away for later. The thing is that old tools have this aura of being outdated. They might be unmaintained. They're definitely less cool than new tools and they can be perceived as way more boring. Whereas the new tools, the shiny new technologies um, stand for innovation, better integration maybe, um, regular support, better updates, and they give you a competitive edge. And uh, frankly, they look very, very good on LinkedIn. And uh, it's it's like you try out a new tool, you put it on LinkedIn, and you have the recruiters coming in and swarm you uh, <laughs> and give you new job opportunities. That's what many think. So let's move to the misconceptions and bias, because there is a lot of bias involved here and a lot of psychological principles too. When you start with a new technology, you generally look at the website of this project or the library that you want to use and you check out a tutorial. But the thing about tutorials of technologies is they are deliberately simple they're deliberately kept small and they show you a happy path. So they give you this sense of confidence when you try out a piece of code on the website that works instantly that you think, okay, this is really easy to use. I could use it for my problems. But the thing is, like I said, they only show the happy path. They are kept very, very simple. And this false confidence can be really, really dangerous if you want to use this thing in production. So the better way would be um, to do a POC, a proof of concept. That would be a larger um project that you use this new technology in just to try it out in a more real world situation and this is generally the best way to evaluate something for uh, a real project that you want to use it in but this of course costs a lot of time and resources and it will not show you all the problems that you will encounter in the future because it's not a full-blown project you're doing, it's just a small subset. And uh, funny story, this actually happened to me. Management might confuse it with a real implementation. In a former company, we did a proof of concept in a few days, showed it to management, and they said, oh, that looks really, really good. When can we ship it? But a proof of concept is not there for shipping. Proof of concept is just to trying out the thing and then throwing it away and rebuilding it. Uh, some of you might also be familiar with the sunk cost fallacy. This is when you invest a lot of time, a lot of money, a lot of effort, a lot of learning time into a technology or a tool. And this gives you a justification for committing to this solution because you invested so much. And this again has the danger of uh, you making an irrational decision when it comes to a tool. This is uh, a thing that probably a lot of you know, Maslow's hammer. It's a quote from Abraham Maslow 
a psychologist. I suppose it is tempting if the only tool you have is a hammer to treat everything as if it were a nail. And this doesn't really apply to if you have only one tool, but it can also apply to a new tool that you just learned and that you then want to use for everything. That brings us to the tractor factor, which is commonly called bus factor, but a colleague of mine uses the word tractor factor, which I like way more because it rhymes. It means that when you are the only one with the knowledge of a tool and you get run over by a tractor or a bus, then nobody has this knowledge. And this is really dangerous, especially when something is used in production and you need quick feedback time about this when something goes wrong. So this is another consideration. Um, is it worth using, using the tool? Because if you are the only point of contact, there is this danger of you being run over by a tractor. But if you are alive, <laughs> it means that all questions will come to you personally. And this can also be really, really annoying. So you have to teach the whole team um, to answer those questions as well. But again, this costs time, this costs money, this costs resources. So the onboarding factor is uh, really important as well. And on the other side of the team, when you pitch a new tool, the other team members have a healthy distrust of options they don't know yet. This is a human thing. It's called the ambiguity effect because we as humans have a pre preference for clear options and options that we are already familiar with because we want to avoid uncertainty. This is already chapter three uh, of this little book about old tools, new tricks. It's called The Unknown, and you will see why. Generally, it is said that you, find, you should find the tool that fits your problem. But is it really that easy? Um, I'm not sure. Because you need all this evaluation time. And you have those things that are called unknowns. And from those unknowns, you have known and unknown unknowns. And I will try to explain what this means. So a known unknown when dealing with a new software could be, if we have 10,000 requests per second, I don't know what will happen, or 20,000 or 100,000. It doesn't really matter uh, what the number here is, but what matters is that you know that at one point things will break. This is a known unknown because you know it will happen, you just don't know when. Whereas an unknown unknown could be, I had no idea that turning on this option would cause memory leaks. This is something that you don't anticipate. It might happen in the future, but you had no way of uh, knowing if this will happen. And Dan McKinley, who in 2015 did a presentation about um, boring technology, says both sets, so both, uh, both sets of the unknowns are typically non-empty, even for tech that's existed for decades. But for shiny new technology, the magnitude of unknown unknowns is significantly larger. So yes, you should find the tool that fits your problem, but don't spend too much time with it. And also consider that it does not need to be a new tool that can solve your problem. Because old tools can be more reliable than new tools. They are certainly more familiar. They can be more compatible because they have been around for a long time. They're 
they can be more cost effective. And this was brought up last time I did this presentation. Somebody said, yeah, and you should consider the community of those tools as well, like the Selenium community, which is very, very nice and pretty big. And Dan McKinley again said, the nice thing about boringness is that the capabilities of these things are well understood, but more importantly, their failure modes are well understood. So I want to give you an example of how we use older tools in our company and uh, especially in my team. And for this, I created a little task for myself on create a website test so I can use it locally and in a GitHub workflow. So in a CI CD context. Um, I'm mentioning this book because I will do a website test that checks a link that has to do with this book. It's called my uh, it's called writing API tests with karate. This is a shameless plug as well. So I've written a book. If you're interested, pick it up. And this is the thing that I want to test. Um, go to my website, click on the link for the book, and then check if the headline, the second one is, what is this book about? So this is my assignment. I would start frankly, with Selenium. I'm not saying that only because this is the Selenium conference, but this is my favorite tool for browser automation. I asked Copilot to give me a definition on, of Selenium, and it said Selenium is a free open source automated testing framework used to validate web applications across different browsers and platforms. No, this is wrong. And I hope you all saw that this is wrong because Selenium is not a testing framework. If you look on LinkedIn today, <laughs> there's a lot of bashing against Selenium and unfair comparison against test framework. No, Selenium is not a test framework. Selenium automates browsers, that's it. That's what the Selenium website says as well. So it does one thing really well, automating browsers. To give you a little time reference here, um, this is me, 1978, that's my birth year. And I wanted to bring up this timeline to show you where those tools and when those tools actually originated. And Selenium can be placed here um, in 2004. So it just recently had a 20 years anniversary. Same year as Spider-Man 2 came out, by the way. Just a little trivia. So this could be a very simple uh, Selenium script that does exactly what I want. So we create a web driver, in this case, a Chrome driver. We go to my website. And then I find the element with the link text, writing API tests with Karate. That is the link to the book. Click on it get the uh, second headline with h2 tag, get the text of that, and just do an assertion if this is the text I expect, and then quit the driver. And everybody who says Selenium is complicated, just look at this and you will see that it's actually not. Here we can see it running inside the IDE. So I use IntelliJ here and um, just to let you know, this is a video that is looping. So I haven't sat there and clicked on it every 10 seconds, but you see that how fast it is. I mean, you click, there's the browser, test is done. So again, for all the Selenium bashers, Selenium is not slow. Okay, let's build on top of that. Let's use Maven. And again, I asked Microsoft Copilot, what is Maven? 
And it said, Maven is a software project management and comprehension tool that provides developers a complete built lifecycle framework. I'm not sure about the project management, but the built lifecycle is correct. And what's the most important thing here in this context is dependency management. But before that, I will give you a reference again. We have Selenium in 2004 and we have Maven in 2002. So it's a little older, older than Selenium. It's the same year as that Spider-Man came out. So we had Spider-Man 2 for Selenium and we have Spider-Man for Maven. Let's see what we have for the other technologies we will put on top of that. This is um, the most important section in the Maven POM file, which is an XML file that describes the project and the build steps and the dependencies. Here, I mainly use it for the dependencies. So instead of having the libraries of the tools in your project, you can just define a dependency on Selenium. Yes, I'm using a, an older version of Selenium here. A lot has happened in releases recently. And I'm also using JUnit to let those tests run as unit tests. And then when we have that, we can actually run those tests via Maven. So there's not much to it. Now we can use the clean test command in Maven and run those. But to make it a little more fun, um, here is how I changed the test to be a unit test, a J unit test. So in the before each, that is executed before every test, I create the new Chrome driver. That means each test will have a clean state at the start, a clean Chrome browser. And the same with after each, that means after each test scenario has run, the browser is quit. And the rest of the code that is annotated with at test is pretty much the same as before. So you see that this already structures your tests nicely and you have those automatic um, browser spin up and browser closing. And here again is how you would run it. So you use Maven clean test and there is the Maven script and here's the browser. So it's just a nice way to run those tests as unit tests. Again, this is looped and again, you see that it's absolutely fast. And I think Maven is pretty great because uh, like you saw, it has an easy dependent man, uh, dependency management. It reduces duplication. Of, it gives you a very standard XML structure when you define the Maven dependencies and the workflow. And you have this straightforward flow. You just have to follow the file and then you know exactly what's going on. And Maven does less. If you look at other solutions like Gradle, um, you will see that you can do pretty much everything in Gradle. But Maven has this limitation that I think is pretty nice because it is less error prone and it, it is just easier to understand. Again, if you disagree with me, please do. Now we are moving forward in the project, but backwards in time again using Bash. And Bash, according to Microsoft Copilot, is an acronym for Born Again Shell, which is actually true. Uh, and it is a command line interpreter that provides a user interface for various operating systems. Um, a kind of true. I mean, everything that Copilot generates sounds good, sounds true, but uh, you really have to take it all with a grain of salt. So Bash, uh, 1989. So we are moving way back in time now, closer to my birth year. <laughs> you, you can also see how old I am. 
and Bash was came out the same year that Batman came out. Is it a coincidence that we have those superhero movies coming out at the same uh, time? I don't think so. So to show you what you can do with Bash, uh, I extended the thing a little bit more. So in the before each block that is executed before every Selenium um, script, before every unit test, I here get a system property called browser. So you can pass uh, this system property browser to the script. And then depending on which browser you choose, you will get a new driver, either Firefox or Chrome or an Edge driver. So this is all Selenium needs to support three different browsers now. If you pass a browser that is not known, it will throw an exception and say browser is not supported. And here is how you do it. Maven clean test and with a minus D, you can pass a system property and then you can pass a value to the browser variable. And uh, this is the bash script that is needed, which is also not that complicated. This line is the most important. The echo line is just printing out running tests with browser and the dollar one is the value that you pass to the bash script. And then we invoke the Maven command again and pass the system property and take the value dollar one that was passed to the bash script. So it looks like this. So if the bash script is called run tests.sh for shell and you pass Firefox, it will invoke the Maven command and pass the browser system property with the value Firefox. To see that in action, I also have this here. So you run test sh with Firefox, and it says running tests with browser Firefox, and here is the Firefox browser. So not much to it. And like this, in, in a few minutes, you have multi-browser support. You can run those tests via a Bash script. And I think Bash is pretty great because it's the default shell in most Linux systems. And also it is on macOS, just built in. For uh, Windows, you have to install an additional thing through Sigwin or Chocolatey, or you use the Windows Linux subsystem, but um, it's generally available everywhere. It's a very powerful scripting language. Again, limited, but that's its strength. It has lots of built-in commands. It can use all the system commands that are available and it has pipes and redirections. So you can chain small commands together and take the output of one command and pass it to the next. And this is actually the Unix philosophy. Um, quoted here is Doug McElroy. And he said, write programs that do one thing and do it well. Write programs to work together. And the do one thing and do it well is exactly what I mean when I talk about Selenium, when I talk about Maven, about JUnit, about Bash, and also about the next one I will mention. Just smaller things that do one thing well. And here is make. And make is the oldest of the bunch. And uh, the definition I found is make is applicable to any process that involves executing arbitrary commands to transform a source file to a target result. This is actually true. Uh, and it is 100% true because it's not coming from Copilot. It's coming from Wikipedia this time. This sounds more complicated than it is. Uh, Make was actually used in the beginning to build 
C and C++ programs. Um, but we can also use it for other things, as you will see. If we look at the timeline, we have Selenium, Maven, Bash. And finally, there is a tool that is older than I am. Make was introduced in 1974. So it's been around for 50 years and we can still use it and it still does its job well. Same year as Texas Chainsaw Massacre came out, uh, I did not find any superhero movie for make, but I hope that doesn't mean anything. So this is make. This is um, not too complex, I hope, make script that I wrote. So those things here, the help and test, those are called targets or goals. And those you can run using make. You can do make help or you can do make test. In the make help, I just print out a little help uh, about this file, as you will see. And the make test should run the test that I defined earlier. This is exactly what I had before, the Maven clean test and the minus D to pass the system property. But now the browser name is, is coming from the outside to the make script. And here it's a little different. We do a dollar and then the name of the parameter we passed, in this case, browser. And the nice thing here is that make supports default values. So like this with a question mark equals, we can say if this parameter is not passed, it should default to Chrome. And by the way, the Maven clean test command is executed in a shell. So we are not using a dedicated shell script here, but what you use in make is automatically run as a shell script. And this is how you would run it. Make test browser equals Firefox. And here you will see that first I invoke just make and make if you just use it like this without a goal, we'll choose the first goal you defined in the make file, which was help. So you see that it prints out the help. And then I use, let's wait for a bit, make test browser equals edge. So in this case, I invoke Microsoft Edge as the browser, and you will see it's still very, very fast. It, it is easy to just change up the browser. And uh, by the way, if you don't know, Selenium now has the web driver management built in. So it, it means that it will automatically download the right driver for you. You don't have to have those drivers on your system. So Selenium is improving a lot. And uh, even though it's an old tool, it doesn't mean it cannot innovate. I think Make is great because again, it has a small number of features. It's available virtually everywhere on every system. And that is also the thing. It is also built in into GitHub Actions. Uh, you can use it in Jenkins. So the Make script you use on your local system to run everything can just be used on a, a CI CD system without any change and you can run it there. And also make us a good entry point for tracing the flow of the of the application because it has a well-defined structure. So if you open a make file, you can see exactly what's going on in which uh, order. Make can also be used to build applications and it is a well-defined proxy for any underlying technology. What I mean with this is uh, we invoke 
Selenium scripts here. We invoke JUnit and Maven, but you could also invoke Python. You could invoke uh, a JavaScript test framework. You could invoke Cypress, Playwright, whatever you want. But the proxy, the make command will be the same. And actually we're using it like this here. So in every new project, there is generally a make file with make test, make build, make deploy that everybody knows. So everybody just has to uh, invoke this, execute this, make test, and you will see the tests execute. It doesn't matter what technology is being used and you don't really have to know. Um, what about AI? So I found this quote that went viral, actually. I want AI to do my laundry and dishes so I can do my art and writing, not for AI to do my art and writing so I can do my laundry and dishes. And this is how I see it as well. I have tested a lot of AI solutions and I work with them daily, especially GitHub Copilot and Microsoft Copilot. I also worked a little bit with uh, Google Gemini and uh, privately, I also use uh, Suno and Heijin and Dali and those things. Um, but there is a dilemma again, because AI helps you with things that you already know, and you need to know stuff to judge if this solution that AI provides you is actually good or not. It hallucinates more than we think. It wants to give you a solution at all costs. And if it doesn't have an answer, it will make up an answer just to please you. So I found if you treat it more like a rubber duck that you can tell your problems and then it might give you a suggestion and the, then you bounce this back and say, oh, this might not work because of those circumstances, then you can develop a solution together. And yeah, it also behaves like humans. You can bribe it. Uh, it will tell you lies. You can say, please give me an answer. My life depends on it. And the answer will be better. So a lot of strange tricks that you can do to work with AI. By the way, this picture um, might be a little strange. And it is because we tried out in the QA team, we tried out the image generation. And we said, please generate a picture with men and women. And the men should not have beards and the women should have beards. And it refused to do that. It uh, would only generate white male <laughs> people with beards. And if you have a prompt that actually does what we wanted to test it, then let me know. But the point I want to make is that AI knows more about old tools. It has way more information about older tools and libraries than new tools, because many questions have already been answered in Stack Overflow or in, in forums and chats. And many use cases have already been covered. So the more it knows about something, the more likely it is to give you an answer and an answer that is actually qualified. So you have less chance of hallucination. Um, some small final thoughts. Be aware about biases. This is not only about when you deal with people, but it is also when you deal with tools. If you read on LinkedIn, this tool is a game changer. You should be skeptical because I don't think there are many game changers out there at the moment. Choose tools very carefully. Please consider the hidden costs, uh, the psychological effects like the sunk cost fallacy and the ambiguity effect because they can give you a false confidence when you use those tools. Don't let familiarity hold you back. If you know something really well, that doesn't mean you cannot use it anymore. It's exactly the opposite. If you know something really well, maybe this is the reason why you should use it first. And try to have this mindset of decoupling progress from technology. 
Making progress doesn't always mean using the cutting edge tech, but it means having very, very good solutions. And those could involve older tools. And with this, I thank you a lot for listening. And if you have any questions, I, uh, I will try to answer them. Thank you. Yes, thanks for that, uh, Benjamin. Um, at the moment, we don't have any questions. We've just got uh, Tiago saying congratulations on the presentation, Benjamin. Doing the basics well is often what we need in an organization. So that's thanks a, a lot, <laughs> Tiago. Yeah, that's exactly how I see it. If you have uh, anything, any backlash, any uh, criticism, then please hit me as well, because I don't think that everything I said is true for everyone. Well, there's lots of little pearls of wisdom in there. And I think the psychology, psychological aspect of investing a lot in something and thinking, well, I can't give up what I've already invested. I think that's uh, an easy one to trip us up, even when we know about the sunk cost fallacy. Yeah, I know. I, and I, I don't say I never had that myself. <laughs> I mean, I also love new things and trying out new things, but it's, you need to really to be careful to use those new things that you're not familiar with yet. Um, that's it for this session. Uh, I'm going to close it down now and uh, head over to uh, the networking table to hang out with Benjamin. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.